very much. Uh, we're going to get going straight away because any time we lose is less time for questions and discussion, and I'm sure there'll be a lot. Uh, thank you all. I am Rachel Davis. I'm the Managing Director of SHIFT. Uh, we are a non-profit organization that works on putting the UN guiding principles on business and human rights into practice. We do that with a range of organizations, uh, including the IOC, um, who I'm currently advising as they move towards a strategic framework on human rights. I also, uh, wearing an independent and unpaid hat, am the chair of FIFA's Human Rights Advisory Board. Um, we have a very good panel today, but as you can see, um, we have a, uh, in some respects, homogeneous panel. Um, we have uh, four athletes uh, with very different perspectives. We have four men. We have me, but I'm not an athlete, okay? Just to be clear, if anyone was in any doubt. I'm a lawyer, I'm good at that, but I'm not an athlete. Um, so I really want to encourage people, uh, and that was not the intention of the organizers when they were setting up this panel, so let me be clear about that as well. Um, I really want to encourage people, particularly uh, women athletes uh, who are in the room um, in Q&A to come in uh, when we get to that. The other thing I would like to point out is that this is a panel of players uh, and athletes' representatives. Uh, nobody on this panel, myself included, represents or speaks for a sports organization. Um, so that means you're getting one set of pers perspectives here, but, but not those of sports organizations. Again, they're in the room. If you want to come in in the Q&A, I would encourage you to do so, uh, but they are not represented on the panel here. Um, let me quickly introduce our speakers, and then I'll make a few opening comments, and then we'll get straight into it. Um, to my right is Jonas Bear Hoffman, who is the Secretary General of FIFPRO uh, Division Europe, but with a global policy mandate, um, and a former semi-professional basketball player. If we were all standing up, you could see the height issue even more clearly, <laughs> even more clearly. Um, to my left is Rojle Prejel. Um, Rojle is a former high jumper, just to add to the height issue, uh, and Olympian. Um, he is a member of the IOC Athletes Declaration Steering Committee. Uh, he was also formerly a member of the IAAF uh, Athletes Commission as well, and he's the Athletes Ombudsman for Slovenia. Um, also to my left, Conrad Smith, a three-time Rugby World Cup champion and former New Zealand All Blacks player. Uh, he's now legal counsel and project manager with the International Rugby Players Association. I feel good. There's a couple of other lawyers I didn't mention. Rojle is also a lawyer, so I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Um, and finally, to my right, Eric Winston, who is in his third term as president uh, of the NFL Players Association after a 12-year career in the game. A couple of framing comments. What do we mean by human rights risks for athletes? Um, this panel is not the only panel on that topic. We've already heard extremely compelling testimony earlier today um, from the perspective of survivors of sexual abuse in sport, all of whom were athletes. Um, uh, so let me just add a little to that. Uh, we can, of course, be talking about discrimination, uh, whether on the base of race uh, or gender or sexual orientation, a denial of opportunities, um, ranging through to some of the much more severe, serious physical and, and mental abuse and injury uh, that we've heard can happen. Um, this can be compounded for younger athletes who are inherently more vulnerable to pretty much any impact we can think of. Um, and it, but it can be a challenge for all athletes because many, at least most sports, share um, a limited time window uh, in which competition and, and performance peaks. Um, and so uh, that, uh, that narrows the frame of reference and, and can put people more at risk. Um, what rights are we talking about? Uh, without getting into technical detail, a wide range of human rights issues, um, from privacy to uh, right to health, to freedom of expression, uh, to labor rights, um, including uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining, children's rights, of course, women's rights, rights of specific groups uh, that may have particular needs. Um, we're also not just talking about individual harms. Uh, I think we have heard already how um, th this is about not just dealing with a, uh, an issue that pops up here and then another issue that pops up there, and that's not what the UN guiding principles are asking us to do either as sports organizations. They're asking us to bring the perspectives of athletes directly into how we make decisions, um, and, there are, uh, and then to take that into account in how those decisions are made, not just to hear, but to hear and act on what we hear. Um, and that is uh, something that is not just a mechanical exercise. 
Um, bringing those perspectives inside the House takes time, it takes effort, and it can be very challenging uh, for different reasons. Um, and we'll hear some different approaches to that today from the panel. Um, as I said, the panelists bring different experience uh, and perspectives on this, but they all share a commitment to athletes' rights and athletes' voice. So with that, Jonas. You are, or FIFPRO, is one of the organizations that is in a position of having an agreement with a global sports body that has recognized its human rights responsibilities. What does that mean? What's different? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And first of all, thanks to, um, to UNESCO and, uh, of course, the IHRB and everybody here who's been involved with putting this event together. I think it's a, it's a fantastic platform, which we probably would have wanted to have for many, many years. And then just the ability to actually address with this group of people here our concerns that we deal with every day to this community, I think, is a fantastic opportunity. Um, as to um, your question particularly, um, what is important, I think, to understand is that sport at this point, professional sports, is profoundly changing. Um, the economics of it are changing. The organizational structures are changing. There is what I like to call an emancipation of stakeholders going on. Um, where powers are being split, powers are being divided in different ways, and uh, where models of organizing sports are changing. And um, what was very important for us in going into a relationship, a new relationship with FIFA, was that whatever change will occur, um, it has to be built with proper respect of the human rights of the athletes. And um, when FIFA made the commitment to its statutes, uh, to the human rights in its statutes, um, I think they deserve to be applauded for taking that step as one of the first ones. Um, but of course, it is then this, the responsibility, I think, also for us as stakeholders to make sure that that is filled with action. Um, so it was very critical for us to have this in our agreement. Um, what has changed? What has it meant? Well, first of all, it gives us a backdrop. It gives us a new structure. It gives us a new prism of thinking about those issues that we incur. Um, and it gives us a very clear protocol through which these things can be addressed. And that is helpful. Um, what it will mean in the future in practice is um, I'd be a bit more careful with the optimism and pessimism about it. Um, we face an enormous amount of challenges, which maybe not everybody is, is aware of that, uh, that is here in the room. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a context of what we're dealing with. So FIFPRO um, is operating with our member unions in 65 countries around the world, representing approximately 60,000 players, male, female, from top level, Champions League level, that probably all of us are watching every now and then on TV, down to people who make literally 100 euros a month or less um, for playing a ball, playing football. Um, so it's an enormous diverse group, and it's a group that has incredibly precarious conditions that they're working under. Contracts are usually a year, maybe less. We have done studies that show that more than 40% of them don't get their salaries on time. We've done studies on the discrimination and violence that they face. You can all see it every time you watch a match. You're on your, in your workplace, around you are 50,000 people and they're yelling abuse at you. And sometimes that is directed from, from management, sometimes that is directed from supposed fans, sometimes that is directed from, from federation officials. And they need protection against that. Um, another area that we've been doing a lot of work on where I think FIFA's human rights commitments will have to be much more pronounced than it is today are the conditions of female football players. Um, some of the considerations that are given to female players um, to play for their national teams are, and pardon my language, are simply ridiculous. We have cases where players have to bargain to get their own tracksuits to go f play for the national team. Um, so we're taking a very strong view on equality of conditions when you play for your country, when you go to a World Cup. We're advocating for equalizing the conditions that are faced by male and female athletes in this environment. Minors, another issue. Football operates a transfer system. I think most of you are familiar with it. That transfer system puts a price and a, a motivation for people to get involved in the movement of, of kids. There is enormous risks. There is enormous abuse going on where a lot more needs to be done. And then finally, of course, the governance of sport itself. You mentioned um, the freedom of association that we as, as athletes and unions have, the right to collectively bargain. Does the traditional association law structure of sports organization provide for the appropriate space for that? In most countries right now, it does not. And the athletes represented in the NFL, in rugby, in football, in other sports have chosen to organize themselves in unions and they have the right to negotiate their labor conditions collectively. 
So we'll need to reform the structures of sports and the governance of sports um, to account for that. In closing one point, and that is where these more systemic and structural problems that we're facing and which we would hope that the human rights commitments of FIFA provide answers to or paths to solutions to, there's another side and that is the very practical situation of what some individuals are facing. And you've heard some of the stories I think earlier today. We have right now a situation of a player um, of Bahraini descent, a refugee to Australia, um, sitting in a prison in Thailand, being threatened with extradition back to Bahrain where he's potentially facing torture or worse. Um, and it's going to be the question in how far sports organizations such as FIFA have their leverage, use their leverage, and in how far that is actually enough to change those types of situations. He's a player. We care about him. We represent him. And um, I think the human rights commitment of FIFA and their commitment in elevating that to the athletes' rights would mean that we have to step up and protect players in those types of situations. So that is the context. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. It gives us a backdrop. A lot needs to happen in practice to see if it fulfills its, uh, its commitments. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Hakim's case. Yeah. It's, for those who are not familiar, this is the case of Hakim al Araibi. Mary referred to him as well this morning in her opening comments. Um, and there are many people in this room, inside FIFA and outside, uh, working to, to try to bring leverage to bear on that case. Um, so thank you for flagging that. Um, and thank you for sticking to time. Um, I didn't mention this, but we agreed that we would do a round of two questions with, uh, with the panelists to try to keep us moving um, and still allow time for, for you, the audience. So Rojle, let me come to you next. Um, when we uh, spoke in preparation for this, um, and given your background uh, as an athlete who also trained as a lawyer, um, you told me that you have a personal commitment um, to bringing the, the, what can be sometimes the abstraction of human rights down to reality for athletes. Um, and you have a fairly unique system in, in Slovenia uh, and your role as a sports ombudsman as part of that. So help us understand uh, your commitment and what that looks like in, uh, in your role. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. So, um, yes, Slovenia in 2014, uh, Slovenian Olympic Committee started with a uh, project, Athletes Ombudsman. Uh, we started at that time, so all the uh, uh, denomination went through Athletes Commission, and then the board and uh, general assembly of the NOC um, uh, then uh, um, adapt the, the name, so I was first Athletes Ombudsman, and then we start, we, basically we start from the scratch, we didn't have any information how to start, how to work, but uh, because I was still, at that time, I was still a competitive athlete, so I took my approach, so very informal, um, confidential um, approach, and personal, so it was... Uh, um, my number on the web and athletes contact me and we sit together or by phone and it was really successful. So in three years I had almost 100 cases, different cases. Uh, we educate more than 1,000 athletes in Slovenia. So for example, Slovenia have 2 million people of population, so 1,000 athletes, it's a lot. And of course, um, uh, through the cases we develop uh, uh, the approach, so um, basically I give three ways of information or three ways of support to the athletes. First is like uh, I provide them or help get them the information where to get, uh, how to apply for the rights or where to get the information about detailed rights they have or where can, get, where can they get some other informations. And the second one is uh, that I give them independent legal advice, so it's important that it's independent. So I also say to them, look, you don't have this right. I think this is very important because um, if they go, if, let's say, for some legal advice is some others, so they want to protect them at any chance, but they forget about rights of other athletes. I think this is very important that when we see particular athletes with one right, we must have in mind that there is another athlete with the, this right, if uh, executed, um, let's say, too invasive, can influence the rights of other athletes. And then the third thing is uh, help them in the disputes they have. 
And because of the success I said, uh, we had uh, 100 cases over three years. Uh, last year, uh, we adopted a new sport uh, regulation, sport law. And the government see uh, the benefit of the institute uh, for the developing of, this athlete, uh, of athletes' rights and also this area in protection. So they decided that they will include uh, the Athletes Ombudsman uh, as an independent uh, institute um, with a legal base in a sport law. And uh, now, from 2018, Athletes Ombudsman Institute uh, is operating independently under the government of Slovenia and uh, with the legal background for, for, for my work at the moment. So, and uh, when you said uh, how to, to bring these abstract rights to the athletes, it's very important because basically we have the athletes who are focused on the training, they are young, their personalities are not developed. So it's very important that uh, the right approach and uh, approach that I took is uh, that I speak with athletes, and when they have the problem, we discuss about the situation. And when we launch what is the situation, then we uh, implement to this situation the rights they have or the rights they don't have. I think this is very important because it's much easier than for them also to share with other athletes, uh, let's say, this situation rather than rights. Because, like I said, they are usually young, they are not lawyers, they... They don't know how to <laughs> interpret it legally. So it's very important, and I think this is the main message for athletes. It's that they know dangerous situations or that they recognize the situation in which their rights could be harmed. So I think this is very important. And then it's up to us and at, uh, from other bodies so that we protect them. But it's important that they know how to monitor, uh, how to find situations where their rights could be harmed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if, did I understand you correctly? It's your personal phone number on the website. I mean, yes, uh, from Institute, yes. <laughs> but I have it in my pocket, okay. so. So you know where to find him, just to be clear. Um, Conrad, let me come to you. Uh, you've had um, a long, well, a wealth of experience, really, in players' associations at the national level, but also at the global level. Um, for, for many in this room, I think we're very familiar with the concept of, of unions and representation in that form, but some may not be. Um, help us understand from your perspective uh, what it means to be um, a player representative uh, and where you really see players' associations functioning effectively. What, what does the best situation look like? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I... Um, came into to sport in a, in a rather fortunate situation in terms of being a rugby player in New Zealand where um, when I started my um, rugby career there was a um, player association that was up and running and then in the time that I played and was involved with the player association uh, we really um, went from strength to strength behind some very strong leadership from our CEO at the time who was still there um, and, and really went from what we look back on as probably an advisory um, board to, to, to the situation now where we see ourselves genuinely as a, as a partnership um, with New Zealand Rugby, the um, national organisation. And that, that took a, a lot of work, um, a lot of hard work, and it took a lot of time. Um, you know, I was there for 12 years and I felt very fortunate to, to see it evolve um, very gradually, but um, continually over that time. And, you know, I came in because I was fortunate enough, as you mentioned, I had a, a legal background before I started playing rugby, um, and that meant I was immediately thrown into the Players Association, whereas uh, most people without a legal background, you know, it's sort of something you do with uh, a lot of experience. But, um, so yeah, I, I was there from the start um, through to the end, and, and I, I saw the benefits. I, I saw New Zealand rugby, you know, and I look at it now from... I'm now you know, living and playing what well, I was playing in France um, as, as a world leader in terms of a player association and New Zealand rugby is in terms of a national sporting organisation, um, what they offer their players, um, what they, how they perform on a global scale 
And for those that don't know um, rugby, I'll um, try to be humble but say that we perform very well for a small country. <laughs> um, <Very humble. laughs> um, yeah, it's hard for me to say. It's a characteristic of the Kiwis. But, you know, and... <laughs> And, and, you know, and that's, and that's not just on the field. Obviously, you may be familiar, obviously, on the field, we've had a sustained period of success. But I think off the field, um, New Zealand rugby, within a small country and a very small economy, has managed to, to match it, you know, with the bigger countries and the bigger economies up here in Europe. And, and they've done that through work with the players. And, it, and it's, a, it's an amazing partnership, um, as I say, that I've been, I feel fortunate to be involved in and, and what I've since learned is, you know, leaving New Zealand and, and, and coming to play in France is just that maybe I, I took that for granted because I now, you know, come to, as I say, a, a much bigger country with far greater resources, a, a country that prides itself on trade unions, yet uh, a player organisation that is, despite the efforts of some wonderful people I've met within the organisation of player, their player association, it is very weak. And, and, their, and rugby suffers in France because of that. I don't think that's too harsh on my fellow Frenchmen here. Um, you know, the, the sport suffers because there is not a strong player voice and, and I hear the players complain about um, the length of their season, about the, some of the treatment they receive within the clubs. And, you know, I'm starting to say to them now, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you're, the strength of players is... Enormous, you know. I've, I'm lucky. I've seen it in New Zealand, and you guys, you know, if you organise yourselves, there is nothing stopping you um, demanding the rights of, of players, the rights to to an education while you you put through a 15-year rugby career. You know that I see that in New Zealand, and it ensures that when we retire at 34, 35, um, we're not going back to square one and having to go back to university because. You know, that, that's what the majority of rugby players will do without, you know, the ability to, to be educated during their career. Um, and, and that's just one example. But, um, you know, and, and now in my work, you know, with international rugby players, it's, it's these different challenges, um, it's different but the same. And, you know, now we're trying to, to, to reach to countries that play rugby that have no um, player associations um, and just how difficult it is um, to, to, to help them um, with a, a whole range of issues, human rights, player rights. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's a, a fascinating um, part of my work and, you know, and, and something I, I feel, like I say, just through good luck and, and, and the experiences I've, I've had, then um, you know, maybe I'm able to do that and help uh, international players and, and grow this movement of, and, and alongside you know, learning from the experiences of other player associations and player advisory boards. To, to help players and, and to you know to grow sport because I, I think I think we all agree you know sports are amazing medium to to make things better and um, you know uh, players play a big part in that. Thanks, Conrad. Um, Eric, uh, when we spoke um, and I like the way you put this, uh, you said that you felt lucky to work in a country that accepts human rights in principle. <laughs> um, but you have to work basically every day to make that real. Um, and I would add, and this is my own opinion, not attributable to anyone else, particularly at the moment. Um, so, Eric, what, what, can you share a bit with us about how you see representation of players in your sport, in your specific context, uh, changing the dynamics of that sport? Yeah, and I think when you come to something like this and you um, start talking to other athletes around the world, uh, it puts everything in proper context, too, because I think sometimes, again, when, when you're lucky enough to, to grow up in a place that, uh, that affords you the rights that you do, you, you do lose context of what other athletes are going through just to participate in athletics or just to get to the ball field or just to be able to do what they do in other countries. And so uh, when we were talking and, and the way I, I looked at it was, was for me as a, as a leader of, a, of our union, we have a group of guys and that want to affect positive change and make a, and what we call a more perfect union. And we have a, guy, a group of guys that aren't just doing social justice. We've got a lot of those and we've 
already making a lot of changes, but we have guys that are going into their communities and starting schools. Uh, they're going in there and starting reading programs. They're going in there and, and helping uh, afflicted children um, to gain medicine, to do whatever they need to do, what they see through their experiences. So the one thing that we've uh, tried to uh, give them is not just the voice, not just a platform, not just the, the ability to go out and raise the money if it's a 501c3, a, a nonprofit, uh, but being able to bring that all together and, and allow it to happen organically. We don't try to force it on them. We don't tell them that it's, it's their right, it's, sorry, it's their duty, but they all know that what they've been given is a special chance and it's not going to last long. It's, uh, it's this period of time in their life that they have a platform and that they want to go out there and use that platform to leave things a little bit better than they found it. And I think that's something that we try to pass down. I know it was passed down to me. That's why I'm doing what I do. And I know that's why they're doing what they do. And for me personally, I, I think it's, it's my job to go out there and, and uh, like I say, provide as much air cover for them as possible. Um, sometimes when you step upon that place and you're advocating on something that might not be popular, it can get lonely. And so when you're out there doing that and we're out there um, talking about something that you believe deeply in, again, whether it's in the social justice or some other space, it can be just you out there. And so I think for me, and, and I look at myself as a representative for all my guys, no matter what. And so I'm going to go out there and have their backs uh, when we do this. So um, for me, I, I know that at some point these things trickle down and that other people will see them, other people will have another idea that's spawned because of them. And for us, I think we just have to keep leading and keep leading from the front. And that's why I tell my guys um, that you have to just keep on leading, whether it's in your communities, whether it's in your beliefs, whatever you need to do. And, uh, and then we're going to be right there for you. Thank you. Very eloquent. Um, Jonas, I want to come back to you. Uh, the issue, and I think um, uh, our colleagues may not be in the room uh, at the moment, um, but, uh, but I'll ask you to explain. Um, the issue of access to remedy uh, when harms do happen um, is a real priority in this whole discussion and in, in Fifth Pro's work as well. Um, and we've been talking, uh, and many of you, I hope, have seen the news over the last um, couple of weeks, but last week particularly, about the situation of the women in the Afghan uh, women's football team who um, have brought extremely serious claims uh, against uh, individuals within the Federation um, and, uh, and in the environment. Um, tell us uh, a bit about what FIFPRO's work looks like when it comes to remedy. Sure. And I, I'd like to, to maybe make three points. And the first one, maybe a bit in context of what was previously said, um, when you talk about remedy, and that might be legalistically not 100% accurate, but the first step to create remedy, in my opinion, that athletes take is they form a union. They get together to protect each other and to create a vehicle that can actually help them to sustain the difficulties that they might be going through. And when we look at sports and the perception of athletes in the sports organizations, um, one of the things that I think is fundamentally wrong is a very paternalistic approach on how we look at athletes. When you hear Conrad, when you hear Eric, they're not people who need to be told what their rights are and how they best um, react to a situation of harm. Athletes are strong individuals. They're competitors. They, they stand together in a team. And I think when they found a union, that's the first step of creating remedy for themselves with whatever they might be going through and what they might be facing. The second point of our work is, of course, and I pointed to the vulnerability and the precariousness of what our, what our players are facing, is that we're trying to establish dispute resolution and arbitration structures which allow them to seek recourse as fast as we can. Um, labor courts are great. In many countries, they're the preferred solution. In many of the scenarios that you can think of for professional athletes, they're simply too slow. An athlete cannot wait for a few years in order to get a resolution of his dispute with his club and in the meantime not get signed by somebody else because they don't know the consequences of the decision. 
But we have situations, I'll just use an example. Our colleagues in Serbia, which is not the easiest country to play professional football, I tell you, there's approximately 500 professional football players in Serbia. Every year the union handles 150 disputes for them over non-payment, over violation of their contractual rights, etc. So in establishing these arbitration mechanisms that actually give them recourse in which they can enforce their contracts, that's a massive step. Now, the structures are imperfect. Um, we have a, a pretty good solution on the international level at, at FIFA, uh, the Dispute Resolution Chamber. It is, it is good in its structure. It is fair. It is unfortunately a bit slow, but we're working on this. But underneath it and above it, there are a lot of problems. Um, on the national level, most domestic athletes do not have access to an appropriate dispute resolution chamber or arbitration mechanism through which they can actually defend their rights. And above it, we have, of course, significant problems um, with the CAS and arbitration structures above, above a FIFA, FIFA DRC or similar uh, structures. Um, the problem is, number one, is access. So, like I said, in many countries, there is no availability of a mechanism. Um, in many countries, or also internationally, when you look at CAS, it's way too expensive. A player who makes a couple thousand euros a month cannot afford to pay advances of costs over 40,000 Swiss francs to actually get a trial. It's simply not possible. Um, the expedience that I said, if you sit through two years through a procedure, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that's very important in this context. A lot of those bodies are not actually built on the capacity to appropriately weigh, in our opinion, the interest that might be at stake when you compare a human rights question of the athlete with a commercial interest or a sporting interest of a sporting organization or a club. We still see that in most cases, those are not weighed appropriately in our, in our, in our um, view. Um, the free choice of a court is a problem. The fair trial standards that are, that are um, accepted on all of those levels are problems. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in this front. Um, but I think what's important, and that goes to the, to the case that you alluded to, those players with those cases, that of course is a massive problem because there are so many of them. There's thousands every year, and they're all very similar, to be honest. If there's 5,000 cases, I would say four and a half are about not paying salaries on time. So they're pretty simple legally, but there's just so many of them. And then there's the other group, which are the extreme cases, such as the one of the Afghanistan women's national team. And uh, I'm assuming most of you are aware, but this is a group of play people who came together against the opposition of their federation and founded themselves a national team and forced them to recognize it over time. And then only two years later, we're all embroiled in an absolute disastrous scandal in which they've been speaking out about the sexual harassment, the rape, the culture that they've been facing. And as a consequence, some of them having to flee the country seeking protection in other, um, in other jurisdictions. Um, just to be able to testify about what they experienced. Now, FIFA took today a decision to um, provisionally suspend the president of the Afghan Federation. I think that's a, that's a very important step, and I think it's, we've been involved in the hearings over the last few days. I think it's a very good move that FIFA did this so quickly. But we need to applaud two people who you will hear of tomorrow, um, and I think, I'm not sure if they're in the room at the moment, um, Khalida Popal and Shabna Mubarez, um, who are part of this group of brave women who actually stood up against a culture of suppression. And what they've been going through, we've been able to help them a little bit. Other people have been able to, to help them a little bit. But what they've been doing in exposing this culture is fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> what I, but, but, but what I would say in closing, and I think that's where all of our work needs to come together, if we now have a center for sports and human rights, what are the procedures, what are the tools that we can develop to help in these situations? FIFA in this case has limitations. We as bodies have limitations. If we can create a structure internationally with the powers, the abilities, the knowledge, the capacities to help these situations, we move forward to sports in a such a magnificent way that, is, uh, that cannot be underestimated. So, when we talk about the center, we hope it will have a strong remedy system. We hope it will have a structure for these types of cases to be brought forward and to be heard. And we would really call on the sports organizations who might still be critical of something like this to accept that challenge. 
it's not against them. It's about cleaning up sports and giving dignity to all those people who might be offended and who might be violated. And if the center can do that, I think that is a, a massive piece of the puzzle that we're improving for the remedy of those rights violations. Thanks, Jonas. Um, Shabna will be speaking on Minky's panel tomorrow, so we'll need to redo that round of applause for them uh, tomorrow, um, and even more strongly. Um, we took a little bit of extra time with that because we wanted to acknowledge their case because it's an important one. It ties into what we heard earlier this morning. Um, so I'm going to ask the rest of our uh, panelists to be, um, to be a little brief. But we need to hear from um, Rojle and from Conrad because uh, both of them have been involved in different initiatives uh, to try to uh, put on paper um, what we're talking about when we, uh, when we start to talk about athletes' rights and athletes' voice. Um, Rajle, the IOC recently adopted an athletes' declaration developed by the committee that you were part of. Um, we heard reference to that already today. I, I'm interested as an independent member of the commission, so again, reminding people that Rajle is not representing the IOC here. Um, what, what, are your, uh, what do you believe is the importance of that document? Um, what do you see as the value uh, in it, and what do you hope can come from it? Um, yes, uh, I think this is the foundation uh, for development of this area, and uh, it's only the beginning, I would say, uh, because now it's important how to implement uh, the, the Declaration of Athletes' Rights and Responsibilities, and I would stress here out it's important that it's not just the declaration of rights but also of responsibilities because we were very focused on this that athletes are also the role models for the younger generation of athletes, inspiration for younger athletes, and as we know also from the human right point of view, it's important that it's not just the rights but also the responsibilities. Where, is, where are these limitations? And we were very much focused on this. So that's why I think this document and also the work of steering committee is very mature because we were not focused just on the rights but also of the responsibilities um, so that athletes can create uh, the safe, and uh, friendly environment so that they can develop uh, their, their passion for sport. Um, Do you want to say a little bit more for people who aren't familiar with it about uh, the, um, the content of, uh -huh. the, of the document? Uh, the, the process? Or the process? Okay, yes. As you like. Um, Just the, for, for people in the room who aren't yeah. familiar. Uh, so it, uh, it was it was, uh, we were in a steering committee about 20 members. Um, only three members were from IOC Athletes Commission. Other members were, were from different uh, sports. So some, some members were representing uh, area associations, uh, member associations, so international federation associations. And uh, we work uh, through uh, teleconference meetings, but what is most important is that uh, based for our work were two surveys, uh, because we, we based our work on two-stage survey. Um, the first stage uh, was addressing the uh, athletes' representatives, and uh, with the aim of the first stage of the survey was how to um, identify the areas that athletes feel they need uh, uh, or they want or they feel that should be included into the Atlas Declaration. And uh, like I said, it was more than 200 Atlas representatives from different uh, um, sports uh, who contribute. Uh, I must also uh, say that there, the survey was composed by two kinds of questions, so closed questions and open questions They can, uh, where they can, uh, could uh, give us some more detailed ideas or detailed information or express their opinions. And upon, uh, upon the first stage, we designed the first draft of the declaration, and then uh, we published the second survey, which was open to the public, to all the athletes. This was a major campaign on the social media, and I think it was more than 4,300 athletes from more than 190 states uh, participate uh, in the survey. And uh, again, it was closed questions and open questions, and upon this, then uh, from the uh, feedback from the, 
from the sport or the field. Uh, we, we composed the final draft, which was adopted by IOC session in Buenos Aires. Thank you. Um, Conrad, uh, you've been involved in quite a different initiative. The, um, as an affiliate of the World Players Association, um, IRPA has been part of the development uh, of the Universal Declaration of Player Rights. We also heard about that this morning um, from Brendan. Uh, can you share with us what issues it covers? And again, from your personal perspective, um, why do you think this document is important and, and what can it change in practice? Yeah, I, I should point out, I mean, this was something, you know, the, the development was before I was personally involved, um, to be honest. So a little less personal. Two, two months ago, yeah, it was uh, human rights and sport was something I, I, I didn't see how it all fitted together. But in the time um, and what I've learnt, and even in the last few days, um, you know, I, I genuinely appreciate, you know, all the work that's gone into it, and particularly from the World Players Association um, and the work they that went into coming up with this Declaration of Player Rights. Um, and, and to me, because it embodies the, the UN guiding principles um, that, and, and the, the work that went into the, the players' rights was, was worked through with all the wonderful um, human rights organisations around the world that came up with these guiding principles and they were embedded in a document that could apply to sports, to athletes. Um, and, that, and that's you know, why it is so um, significant and so special what's come up with it, and it includes um, the right to remedy. And if I've taken anything away from this morning, you realise how essential that is, you know, when you're affording people rights, you absolutely have to um, provide a right to remedy. Um, and, and that's something that, which it, it, it addresses and, and has since been picked up by um, FIFA, uh, UEFA, not yet by World Rugby, which is, uh, is, is a job um, for us, international players, um, and there's obviously other sporting bodies which we um, are waiting um, for, for, to, to adopt also. And, and I think I'd just make a couple of points on that. I think, you know, when, and, and I, I was reminded of it this morning, when you, when you talk about, when you talk to national sporting organisations, international sporting organisations, um, and you talk about human rights, their initial reaction, I think, is fear. Um, and we talked about this morning in, in relation to sexual abuse and, and, um, and to, to child rights. There's a fear of what they're going to uncover, which to me is completely illogical. Um, you know, if, if you're running an international sporting organisation or any business um, and you're talking about fundamental human rights, there shouldn't be a fear of what they're going to uncover. Um, you know, you, you should have enough respect and a, enough knowledge in the, in the ongoing business of, of your organisation that then you see that as an opportunity. Um, and, and I think that's an opportunity. I, you know, I want to say to World Rugby, and, and this is, you know, our whole angle is going to be that, you know, not only is there nothing to fear, we can actually, you know, our athletes, our rugby players can then become champions of human rights and how powerful that would be in an international community, um, you know, and, and that's an angle, you know, don't worry about it, don't fear it, be, be proud of it, see it as an opportunity, and, you know, I think that's the way to, to get these, you know, international bodies on board. Yep, everybody up here is nodding on that, um, and people in the audience as well. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm conscious of time, so let's come to Q&A. We're going to take a quick round. If you've got a burning question, please put your hand up. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can't say no to Mariam. Okay. We're going to do seven. Um, John, there's one. Tim, John, and then we'll go through the rest. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen, you were next. Okay. Tim, go ahead. And we'll take more. Um, you talked about various forms of um, um, voice um, and also union representation of athletes. Um, is, is there a, um, a significant difference between um, players who are part of a team sport and players who play what might be called individual uh, sports in terms of uh, the capacity to organise? Um, uh, are there different dynamics there or are uh, all athletes and players the same in terms of organising them or them organising themselves? Sorry to ask a question, but I couldn't resist. Um, 
the two questions. One is the issue of coherence and alignment between both the athlete, uh, the, the IOC charter, the, the World Players one. I believe WADA is also developing an athlete's charter as well. Um, is it a problem that these three sit apart, or should they be more coherent than they are, is the first question. And the second is, Roger, I think you mentioned responsibilities also being part of this. And that's an interesting question. I don't doubt for a second that athletes have responsibilities. But in a human rights context, and given the power dynamic we heard a lot about this morning, when we talk about the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, we, we, we tend to put the responsibilities with the governments or the businesses or the sports bodies, not with those that we're trying to protect. And so, again, does that, the idea of there being responsibilities for athletes in a human rights sense, does that, I'm just more interested to hear a little more about that. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to wear my athlete hat. I first want to say what a difference one year makes between Geneva to uh, where we are today in Paris and having the conversation we are. I've t it's incredible to see um, the level of understanding of human rights. I think we've come full circle in a year's time. How many people in this room really clearly understand what it means to, when we talk about human rights and the effects to athletes and, and how it's being implemented within, within the system and the problems within the system to do it. Um, to my question, I'm, I've been trying to form this question because it's, it's been an excellent panel up there and I'm just so grateful to all of you. Um, one of the things that, first of all, the first part of my question is, is that I, when I'm, we're talking about this, a lot of the, the, the panels that are up there, as amazing as they are, um, they're coming from the professional circle of sport. So there's a lot of financial opportunities um, and, and, and structural implications of, of leagues to be able to support player unions. So the, the, question, what, the first question I have as an elite athlete myself and gone through the Olympic system, it's a very different system in terms of the structure, the power influences, um, where national, international federations and govern, even governments, I was involved with this with my own Canadian government, um, and interjecting in kind of the, the relationship in which they took to oppress the issues that were going on in conjunction and in, in, in savoring their relationship with the World Anti-Doping Agency and with the IOC. So for me, Canada is in a unique situation to most countries in the world, one of two countries in the world that actually has a human rights level of uh, a legal, legal system, particularly in the province of Ontario. So for me, my, the province of Ontario paid for my legal fees against the IOC. So what it did, it made me as an equal. And for a lot of athletes, and coming back to the CAS and the SDRCC, for instance, they do not have the skill sets as a legal system and as an arbitration body to be even having these discussions, let alone the costs that are associated to it, let alone the legal professionals that are even intersecting in this space on human rights. They do not understand clearly what human rights is in terms of the world of sport law. So that's my first question back to you guys. And what can we do at the elite levels of Olympic and Commonwealth uh, sport um, to, and I'm looking at the center as being potentially that body to be that international body to be able to be central to this, this discussion and be relative to those athletes and the system and accountable to the athletes and services. Um, and the, I'm, I'm the, not sure we can add a second question. My, well, I, just want, I, just, and I just want to ask Rosel one question. Okay. In okay. terms of the Olympic Athletes Commission and the Rochelle. paper that they, they generated, how many athletes that had gone through human rights violations were actually interviewed through that process when creating that document? Okay. Um, we have another four people on the question list, and <laughs> this, this is where um, I do a bargain with the organizers, um, because it's going to be impossible for our panelists to respond, and I'm going to invite them to respond to the pieces of the questions that are most relevant for them. Um, some have been specifically directed at people, but otherwise they're going to have to pick and choose. Um, so uh, I'm looking uh, to John to say, can we steal a little more time? And next year, can we have at least two hours? Um, but that's next year. Uh, we can take an... Okay, all right, great. Okay, so we can do this, thank you, with a little bit more breathing space. Um, and apologies to the people who are coming in the session next. Uh, there's a question there, and then David, and then we come down the front. Uh, let, me take, let me take this one more, and then we'll, we'll come back. 
Hi, I'm Pavel Klimenko from the Fair Network. Um, I've got a question for, for Eric on athlete activism. So when athletes, especially at elite level, stand up not for, just for their immediate human rights but for human rights of others in wider society, and I'm talking specifically about Colin Kaepernick, and, you know, he did amazing things and, and is now facing uh, quite serious repercussions. What uh, can unions do uh, in, you know, supporting athletes in this situation, being f facing, um, being locked out uh, from their profession by, by leagues and by, um, uh, and very short one to, uh, to join us uh, from FIFPRO. Uh, FIFRO is an association of associations. Uh, sometimes it feels like uh, on national level some of the unions are um, being behind the agenda, being, being slow in, say, accepting female members. Uh, you know, with, with the case of Afghan national team uh, that's been raised today, uh, you know, has union has done something uh, for them. Uh, or, or, you know, at, at di in different countries, for example, like uh, relevant for me in Eastern Europe, uh, being slow on reacting to discrimination as well. Uh, what is FIFPRO doing to, you know, urge their national members at the national level to, to do more on that? Thank you. Okay. Um, great. We're going to take a first set of answers and then we'll take the second set of questions. Um, so, let me just run down the panel. Um, Eric, you want to start? Take the one that was for you. That was the most amazing Q&A thing I've ever Usually it's one and one in America. This, uh, that was coming from all angles. So uh, You can handle it. I didn't, I didn't have the piece of paper in front of me. Ah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll answer the direct question, I think, mostly. Uh, you know, through our union, uh, Colin has uh, is is advanced his rights to uh, file a collusion case against the NFL. We're helping in every way we can with that case. Uh, he's, uh, it's within our CBA. It's in, within something we bar bargain. Obviously, that's ongoing, so I can't really get into um, the, the details of the case, but we're advancing that case as quickly as we can, as fast as we can, through our, and this touches up on something else, through our grievance process that is also collectively bargained, so that if a player is cut, uh, that is hurt, he can file a grievance. Uh, if he's not paid, you know, certain, obviously we don't have uh, some of those problems um, like in other uh, countries, other sports. But uh, there's a grievance process set out for every single um, possibility, whether it's injury, obviously in this case, um, uh, you know, wages or, or, you know, collusion in that sense. So uh, that's, that's the process Colin's going down right now. Hopefully we'll have a decision sooner than later. Um, it's advancing. Uh, and that's really all I can say about that. But the, the one thing, and I'll just touch on a, on a broader, the scope of what was being said is how important it is for the athletes to have their body, to have their union, to have their voice. Because at the end of the day, I, I wasn't appointed this position. Uh, someone elected me. The body of players of the NFL elected me to represent them. They wanted me to be their voice among other guys that they've elected to be their voice. And that's how we've looked upon this is that I, I don't uh, – I come up here and I speak on behalf of the NFLPA because I was elected to this spot because they wanted me to speak and because we afford them those rights of the democracy and everything else of voting people in and out. And, and that's what we do, and that's how we collectivize it. And on top of that, too, so there was a, it was made, um, we look at not just the union from a legal standpoint, but we also look at it from a business standpoint. We're self-sustaining. We go out, we, we've bargained for our commercial rights. So we go out and we make money to sustain our union. We don't run our union off of dues. And that's a very foreign concept for a lot of people, even some people in the, even, even some of our professional uh, unions in, in America. We don't run, we go out there and we commercialize our rights because we've retained them in bargaining. And, and we go out there and we, we make money in to sustain because that gives us power. That gives us bargaining leverage. And we're trying to help our other unions. We're, have, we're helping the WNBA. We're helping we represent uh, the U.S. Women's National Team as well, trying to pay it forward, trying to help them become self-sustaining because we know how much power it's given us. So in other organizations that try to strip that power away, the commercial rights, our NCAA, our college system is sim similar. Uh, the IOC is similar in this situation. Is It's always we know better than you. Right? We always, we know a little bit better than you. It's that paternalistic, and sometimes they want to say it's about money, but at the end of the day, it's about control. 
and, and that's what the unions the union tries to take back that control and it's always a give and take we're never perfect we're not perfect our CBA isn't perfect but we're always going to fight that control and that's that's how I look at things Before I answer, maybe it's the moment to repeat the applause. Uh, Kalida and uh, Shabnam just walked into the room. Exactly. might get that all over again tomorrow. <laughs> Since you missed the run-up, I'm sorry. Um, but Jonas, can you come back on the questions? Because we need to... I'll, I'll try to get back into the more technical side of the discussion. Um, I'll, take the, I'll take the direct one maybe first. Um, number one, you spoke about... Um, you, you, you put the context of the Afghanistan situation. Um, you can imagine, and I think all the trade union people in the room will imagine, it's not that easy to organize athletes. And, and any type of workers in certain countries. Um, and it's clear that our unions, wherever they operate, face different scenarios. Um, I'll be frank, some of our union leaders, and that is not Afghanistan, they're facing threats of violence and death just because they want to try to represent football players. So I would put that as context first. Now, are there unions within our membership who we're trying to help to get to that next level? Absolutely. But they have different conditions that they're working with. We have one of our members is the oldest player union in the world. They're more than 100 years old. They have 150 people working for them. They can do, of course, a different level of work and anticipate problems at a different level than somebody who's just set this up and with two people is trying to organize athletes in a country which might have thousands of kilometers just to travel from team to team to meet them. So. Absolutely, there's work for us to do. There's work for all of us to do to always improve those, those standards at which we represent. I think that's normal. I think all trade unionists know that our movement has to innovate and has to find new solutions, and we consciously, constantly try to do that. But I would say in general, all those guys in the end and when women who do this, they're constantly fighting against exactly what Eric pointed to. And they do it at different levels under different circumstances, and we're trying to help them to do it at the best level that they can. I'll take some of those other questions from, from Tim and John, which I think they're sort of coming together in a similar vein, um, with some remarks that I had anyways following up on, on previous comments. Um, I think there is a real issue with those different declarations. I'll be blunt. Um, FIFA Pro is part of World Players. Um, Brendan, you heard from him earlier this morning. World Players represents 85,000 unionized athletes around the world. They were not part of that process. And the problem is, since this document is adopted by the IOC, it might impact their contracts, it might impact this, the environment in which they operate, and in that context, that is a problem, because they, the NFL guys elected Eric. Now, NFL, American football is not an Olympic sport, but you see the context. They need to have that representation respected that they chose, the vehicle that they chose to be heard by. The other thing is, when these different declarations come together and when we did the work as, as world players, we didn't try to invent something new. <laughs> human rights are human rights. Brighter people than us have thought about these laws which apply to everybody. So we don't, all we did is to translate that over into the context of our people. But the rights are the rights and they apply because they're athletes but they're first human beings and so those rights are there. Um, so I don't think that we should start to enrich or qualify the access to those rights based on respect for sporting rules or other mechanisms. So that's why we feel very strongly about our declaration, which is an embodiment of the rights that exist and that these people deserve to have and that they should be afforded to, not put into the context of responsibilities, which they surely have, but they shouldn't be put in the same context as human rights that they enjoy. Um, I think this is a, we don't claim to represent all athletes. 
There's a difference between Olympic athletes and team athletes. Surely there is. It is not the same traditional structure of employment, but if you ask me what they should do to overcome that and what, what you questioned, how can they take that next step, I would encourage them to unionize. They might not be traditional labor contract employees, but there's a lot of non-traditional employment out there in all kinds of sectors. Get together, form a union. A union has different vehicles and powers than an athlete's committee or anybody else. And in sports, I think, and we had a great conversation with Philip Jennings, who's in the room, I think you all know him. The player unions are, we're unions, but we put it in a, in a new scope, right? And I think we, we give it an emphasis that also tells other people having a union is still good. Barack Obama a few years ago tweeted, if Tom Brady has a union, you should probably have a union. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to do, and I think the same counts for those guys, right? If, if Olympic athletes want to take the next step, and not a self-sustaining sport like American football or European football or international football, the way that we look at it. Get together, unionize, organize yourself, demand your rights, and with that you'll contribute to the growth and the economic viability of your sport. We're going to have another round of questions, so I want to come to Josh. Okay, um, especially I will, will uh, try to answer the question regarding the responsibilities. So I hope this will not sound too legal, but uh, we know <coughs> the two pacts after the Universal Declaration, what, what is the difference between Universal Declaration of Human Rights and two pacts which were adopted years later. But anyway, the idea behind the the Atlas Declaration is, or the, our motto was, uh, from the athletes for the athletes. And it was not meant that we are doing just this declaration in relation to the organization, but also for the athletes, how we, we need to behave among each other, because we know, that, let's say, for example, freedom of expression could become hate speech and, and can harm another athlete, your teammate or your opponent. And because we know that the values that sport have in the societies are very important for development of society. And that's why we think that it's also important that we athletes have responsibility among each other. And this is meant mainly with the responsibilities. And then another question, uh, how, how many athletes were uh, that was harmed, uh, were included into this um, uh, uh, surveys, I cannot answer this. I'm happy to provide this information if you will after come to me and give me, but I don't have this information, but um, we are uh, uh, steering committee members and other athletes representatives, we get some information, where are the problems so that we could, so this, this was the base for starting the process. But this was not, let's say, for example, uh, that in the survey was some extra uh, question or some extra op option to, to identify. If, on, on the specific yeah, yeah, issue yeah, yeah, that Kristen yeah. was raising. But right. I, I, I will be happy to provide this information. I think any people would be interested in any further detail or, or breakdown you can provide yeah, about yeah. the process, so absolutely. Um, right, we're going to take the remaining four questions, then everyone's going to get a final comment, and then we're going to move to the next panel. So um, I had David, I had Minky, uh, yourself, and Mariam. Be very quick. Um, David, and with, quick, quick questions, yep. please. Uh, with athlete comments. activism on the rise, um, can, can each of you, and probably that's a bit ambitious, just give us an answer of how critical you think it is for sport governing bodies uh, to create manageable and meaningful opportunities for respectful and constructive activism by athletes. Minky Warden, Human Rights Watch. I wanted to echo Rachel's comment about the composition of the panel and say that um, to the room, 
whenever there are opportunities to raise the voices of uh, women, uh, to be inclusive, to include people with disabilities, I think we really have an obligation to do so. And I know the organizers have worked very hard, but we do, it has to be said. Um, I also wanted to ask the panel, um, you know, Human Rights Watch has a wonderful relationship with the unions. There is no substitute for the work. We see the absence of unions um, often leads to catastrophic outcomes. But facing the reality that the majority of athletes are not unionized, it's related to Tim's question, but what practical remedy is there and how can we work to, we know that there is no meaningful remedy in many cases. Um, so what can we do to create a remedy that will um, be accessible in especially a short term, not, not years of litigation, but a meaningful remedy for athletes who are non-unionized? Um, PM on Discover Football. Um, I have a question, well, actually to all the panelists, but especially to Rojal. Um, hope you pronounce your name okay. Um, so I wonder whether the Dr. Carter principles um, apply at all. Like, I'm, I'm uh, asking whether like transgender and intersex rights, um, you know, like are part of your work, and especially um, as to IIF's um, Athletes Commission. Um, do you have any stance on Casa Semenya's case? Has she ever approached you or gotten any support as to that? Uh, my question is, uh, if your organization or union is able or um, willing to uh, support and protect athletes whose right is violated, by their own government. As you know, uh, a few countries, including my country, Iran, doesn't recognize the state of Israel. And during the past few decades, Iranian athletes were not able to and allowed to uh, play against Israelis. Uh, that's not uh, a written law, but they know if they do that, they would face, uh, and their family would face uh, consequences. So my question is um, how you're able to do that because they, their sacrifices, they, uh, they fake being sick, uh, they intentionally lose to not face them, uh, and this issue never been brought up, so I was wondering how your organization can help. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to do a very unfair thing to the panelists, which is ask them to say basically no more than two sentences in, in, as their final answer. And it's not going to be possible for them to answer what's been put on the table now, but we really are at time. Um, these conversations will play forward over the next uh, day and into the future work of the centre. Um, and Conrad, I'm going to give you a special exemption, which is after you give your answer, you can leave the stage because you have a plane. <laughs> so it will be very dramatic. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief, obviously. Um, Please. Look, I, it, and, and I think it relates mainly to the difference between individual and team sports, which is being well answered. But I, I just, you know, for my position, I, I always encourage athletes, you know, as I, as I said earlier, the power of their voice and, and the necessity of them to control the direction of, of their sport is enormous. And the, and the governing bodies... It's a fear of losing power. I understand that. I've seen it being broken down over years, you know, with New Zealand rugby. But the, the results come, and, and you've just got to trust the, the, the power of players and, and the direction that your sport, would, sport will head um, with that trust. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Um, we're now going to come to Rojle. I just want to be clear that he was a former member of the IAAF Commission, so he's not a current member. Um, but if you want to give two very quick sentences to close us off. Um, yes, I, like uh, she said, I am not. Uh, uh, I was the chairman of IAAF Atlas Commission, but at that time this question was not open. So I don't know what is the stand of IAAF Atlas Commission at the moment. So I cannot answer this. Uh, but. Uh, regarding general principles, because uh, 
Athens Declaration in the preamble had that we were inspired by the United Nations Human Rights Declaration and the other documents. So, but in, in what we wanted is that this abstract we, we in the declaration that we put more that Athens will understand, but it still will stay as an umbrella document. So it, this explains. Uh, um, and about the remedies, so in Slovenia we took approach with Athens Ombudsman, so it's not, let's say, legal, but we solve a lot of problems. And also the sport federations find this as a very useful because sometimes there are some problems which are basically can be solved with some mediation or some approach and you just need some fresh view on the situation. Thank you. All right, even quicker. <coughs> Three questions, sir. Um, on athlete act activism, I think you put it well when you said create space, because I think that's essentially the role that they have. The athletes themselves have to come forward and determine what the activism is that they want to step into. Um, but clearly there's a responsibility for sports governing bodies and anybody surrounding athletes to actually allow them and encourage them to be emancipated human beings and not the traditional way that you don't want them to have an opinion of something that is seen to be political or something of the sorts. Um, remedy for non-unionized athletes, I think it's a, I think it's a challenge um, because the remedy in, my, in our experience comes with trust and with accessibility. They're different to create for people who are not organized in a group and who do not elect their own representation. With regards, for example, with the work of, of an ombudsman, that's of course possibly a way for remedy, but it's not a matter for representation. An ombudsman doesn't represent. So unless we create structures that allow for that, I think it'll be, it'll be challenging. And on the, the last point on governance violations, uh, definitely we're trying to help, but frankly, I'm also be honest, our capacity is there. We contribute, but our capacities are limited. And the way that we're trying to address this is actually through multi-organization um, alliances with organizations like the Human Rights Watch, like Transparency International, who are working with through a structure called SRA, which gives us then more capacities to actually address some of those very difficult scenarios where also our power, powers might actually not be enough to solve it ourselves. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, none of this is easy. And if the solutions, if they were easy solutions, they would have been found by now. So it, it, this is step one. Get a lot of smart people in the same room and let's start talking about the yeah. issues. Yeah. And let's start yeah. figuring it out. Yeah. Uh, step two, real quick, to your point is you got to pressure some of the sponsors. You got to you got to make sure that that they're that they're, that they're what they're sponsoring is is above board, is, is worthy of human rights, is worthy of all our causes. So um, I just, I salute out everyone here that's doing everything they can to help athletes and to help human rights and sport. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to the panel.